Cindy Kelly, and we have our guest, Robert S. Norris. Right. Would you say your name and spell it? Uh, I'm Robert S. Norris, uh, R-O-B-E-R-T, uh, middle initial S, uh, last name Norris, N-O-R-R-I-S. And um, it's February 13th, uh, 2013. We're here in the offices of the Atomic Heritage Foundation. Well, um, we're, we're here this morning to talk about uh, Hanford. And um, as a biographer of uh, General Leslie Groves, um, it's my perspective to look at how he made the decision uh, to cite uh, the plutonium production and separation at, uh, in the state of Washington and uh, how he went about all of that. So um, he got the job on uh, September 17, 1942, and um, d dove quickly into uh, a host of decisions about uh, how to make the bomb, how to develop, test, and use the bomb. Uh, one of the immediate things he did was to uh, buy Oak Ridge uh, in Tennessee, which was already uh, being looked at as a place to enrich the uranium and also to um, make the plutonium, which had recently been discovered by Glenn Seaborg and his team in California. Um, almost immediately, Groves decided that uh, the company that he wanted to uh, oversee um, the making of the plutonium was DuPont. Uh, Groves was uh, in the Corps of Engineers, the Army Corps of Engineers, and had already built uh, dozens of uh, munition plants in the run-up to World War II, and uh, knew uh, people uh, in DuPont uh, very closely, had worked with them. So one of the immediate things he did was to go to the president of uh, DuPont, a man named Walter Carpenter, and uh, basically order him to um, take over <laughs> and build, build this plant. But he couldn't tell Carpenter what it was that he was going to build. He couldn't tell him the location of where it was. Um, and uh, Carpenter said, well, I'll, I'll get back to you. And he went to his executive committee and really, without knowing uh, what, what the mission was, uh, gave Groves uh, a yes answer, and uh, off they went. One of the immediate things they did was to decide to separate uh, where uh, the plants were going to be. Uh, originally, they were all going to be in Oak Ridge in Tennessee, and uh, um, Carpenter and Tupont and Groves decided to uh, locate it somewhere else. So um, a list was uh, put together by the Corps of Engineers, and um, um, eventually the Pacific Northwest looked like the best place to do this. And Groves uh, recruited um, a young uh, lieutenant colonel named uh, Franklin Mathias, Fritz Mathias. And uh, along with uh, two DuPont engineers, uh, sent them off to uh, the Northwest to look over the sites. And they looked in California and Idaho and, uh, and eventually Washington. And uh, in December, and this is in December of 1942, um, Matthias, they're, they're flying over and um, he sees that this area in uh, the state of Washington is ideal and comes back to Washington with a report, gives it to Groves, and basically on New Year's Day, 1943, uh, the decision is really made to site the plutonium facility in the state of Washington. Over the next few weeks, uh, Groves actually makes a trip uh, to Washington to uh, make sure that it's the right one. And uh, they begin procedures to uh, take the uh, land uh, that they need, which eventually grows to um, half the size of the state of Rhode Island. Um, and um, they, they proceed to take, the, uh, take control of this area and uh, put into place uh, the things that will eventually become the reactors and the ke chemical separation plants. And I think there are over 500 buildings that are built. Uh, train tracks, roads, uh, living quarters for uh, what will eventually be about 51,000 workers at, at the peak to build all of this. Um, the location was um, based on criteria that they had uh, set forth and that Matthias knew. 
Uh, it had to do with uh, uh, a reliable source of electricity, and there were two dams nearby, one the Bonnefield Dam, and also uh, on the Columbia River, they needed vast quantities of uh, water to cool um, the reactor, which they used, and um, this was, of course, part of the um, decision process of which kind of reactor to use. Uh, should it be uh, air-cooled or helium-cooled or water-cooled? And uh, Eugene uh, Wigner, uh, one of the uh, Hungarian uh, Martians, um, was um, the chief designer of the uh, water-cooled graphite-moderated reactors, uh, which became um, what was built at, at, uh, at Hanford. So um, eventually three reactors were built, um, and the B reactor uh, became the first one to uh, produce uh, plutonium. Um, so January 1st, uh, 1943 is um, sort of the, the date when Groves made the decision to locate things at Hanford. Um, and the first reactor uh, become, goes critical in uh, late September 1944. So in a mere uh, 20 months, um, they build the reactor and uh, everything that was needed. And uh, plutonium is um, uh, started to be um, produced in the reactors at Hanford. Now, of course, the immediate startup uh, faced them with a, a serious problem because the reactor, after a few hours, shut down. And why did it shut down? It shut down because of a particular uh, phenomenon of physics called uh, xenon, uh, xenon poisoning. And um, the design of the reactor um, of course, has uh, different tubes. Um, and how many tubes to make and, and fill with uh, fuel rods was, uh, you know, another decision uh, that DuPont and Groves um, came to. Now, the overall reactor had 2004 uh, tubes, uh, spaces, but it was only filled with 1,500 originally. Um, and there were many people who said, well, let's just build a smaller reactor. But both DuPont and Groves were, you know, conservative and built excess in the expectation that it might be needed. And in this case it was. And um, after they determined why the reactor shut down um, in September of 44, they decided to fill up the other 504 tubes with fuel rods, which would overcome the process of poisoning, which halted the reactor originally. Now, had that not been done, had they built a smaller reactor, had the poisoning been um, impossible to overcome, of course, the plutonium would not have been ready uh, when it was. So uh, the conservative um, engineer mind of Groves and the conservative engineers of DuPont um, built in a solution to this problem which they didn't know they were going to face originally but did face and did overcome. Hanford, as I said, is a, you know, a gigantic expanse of land that was um, taken. Um, they only used about 10 percent of it to build uh, the, the particular buildings that they needed. And originally there was, I think, some 500 buildings uh, all supporting uh, two processes, uh, reactor production and uh, chemical separation. These were the two parts, the two main parts, uh, to extract um, plutonium from the uh, irradiated fuel rods. And um, there was a fuel rod um, factory there to make the fuel rods. So the fuel rods went into the reactor. Uh, the reactor was eventually um, critical and turned on and, and working. And then what you needed to do was to push the rods out of the reactor um, into a cooling pool and then take the rods to the chemical separation uh, 
canyon, which is uh, an enormous um, facility to uh, separate chemically the uh, irradiated fuel rods and e extract plutonium. Now all that was needed for the test which uh, was codenamed Trinity, which took place on July 16th, 1945, uh, all you needed was about six kilograms, about 13 pounds or so of plutonium. Then you needed an equal amount for the bomb that was eventually used at Nagasaki. So all of this uh, activity at Hanford was to produce a, a, a very small amount uh, of plutonium. Um, but after a while, the um, engineers at DuPont, and uh, oh, with Matthias being the area engineer, um, was to um, produce the plutonium in a uh, calculated way so that you knew how much you were going to have. And after a while, after all the problems were solved, um, in early 1945, um, Groves began to see approximately when uh, he would have enough plutonium for a test bomb, a test gadget, and uh, a, a real working military bomb. So the plutonium was um, transported in an interesting way uh, from Hanford, Washington to Los Alamos, New Mexico. Um, I think it's a perfect example of Groves' obsession of, um, of compartmentalization, of keeping everyone just doing the task they were assigned and, and no other. So what they did was uh, after the plutonium came out of the chemical separation plant, it was put into a um, convoy of vehicles. It was put into a, a, a truck, a panel truck. And the convoy went from uh, Hanford, Washington to um, Utah, to uh, Salt Lake City, outside of Salt Lake City, and was met by another convoy that had come from Los Alamos, New Mexico. So those that came from Washington, the state of Washington didn't know where this was going. They just turned it over to the convoy that, was, that met them in Utah, and the convoy from New Mexico didn't know where this came from. So everybody who was participating in the transportation of the plutonium from Hanford to Los Alamos either didn't know where it was going or didn't know where it came from. So this is how the plutonium got to uh, Los Alamos, most of it. Uh, as we got closer to uh, July and August, there were some uh, airplane uh, transports uh, also. But most of the plutonium, uh, which came in batches as it was finished, uh, was transported in this, uh, in this way, which was um, designed to keep everyone ignorant of uh, exactly what they were doing, basically. In the beginning of uh, explorations into uh, atomic physics and what it may mean, uh, it was originally located at uh, several universities, uh, Columbia University in New York, uh, the University of Chicago, and in Berkeley. These were the main ones, but there were many others doing small-scale research. Um, at a certain point, um, uh, Vannevar Bush, who was basically Franklin Roosevelt's science advisor, uh, realized that this was going to have to be uh, a much larger effort, that it couldn't be done in the uh, university laboratory, and that uh, the Army had to be brought in. Um, and so really, uh, at the end of um, 1941, uh, just around Pearl Harbor Day, um, Bush gets the okay to um, transfer uh, responsibilities to the Army. He did this also because it was going to be expensive and it was uh, easier to hide uh, a large uh, appropriation within a growing budget that was designed to fight World War II eventually, and uh, to bring in um, uh, army, the, the Army uh, into the effort. And the logical uh, group, the logical organization was the Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, and, 
And by the time we go through uh, the early part of 1942, um, we eventually get, um, by the summertime, a, uh, a commitment by the Army. Of course, they're doing many, many other things. The war is underway. Uh, they're, they're, they're fighting all over the world. They're fighting in the Pacific. They're fighting in, uh, in, in Europe, uh, are, are about to fight in Europe. And um, so there's not great en enthusiasm for this, you know, uh, wild idea here of uh, making a new kind of a bomb. So, um, but finally, it does get the Army's attention, and they assign an um, uh, engineer, a man named James Marshall. Uh, he's assigned in the summertime of 1942. But Bush and uh, his um, colleague James Conant, who is uh, also president of Harvard University and part of, uh, part of the team to mobilize science for the, the war effort, uh, they decide that uh, Marshall isn't moving fast enough. He, he just is not, um, uh, not the man for the job here. So um, basically under direction of Bush and Conant, uh, and they ask uh, Marshall, General Marshall, George Marshall, no relation to James Marshall, um, you know, give us your best man. Uh, we, we, we've got to move faster here. And they uh, look at um, then Colonel uh, Leslie Groves, who um, was involved in a hundred projects, more than a hundred projects, of mobilizing uh, America's efforts to fight World War II. So he's building munition plants, uh, airfields, uh, depots. Uh, with his left hand, he's building the Pentagon, which uh, was done in, in a remarkably uh, short period of time. So um, Groves is already controlling about a million people in, in this mobilization effort, uh, which is, um, and um, by the time we get to the, the summer of 1942, um, a great deal has already been done uh, to um, mobilize the um, uh, war effort within the United States. And Groves is looking forward to uh, going overseas and being a combat engineer uh, as they prepare for the invasion of North Africa and eventually the invasion of Europe. But it's not to be. And uh, on September 17th, 1942, um, Basically, his, his boss, his army boss, uh, a man named Brian Somerville, who was a, a force of nature by himself, uh, tells Groves, uh, I, have a, I have another job for you. Now Groves, of course, one of his responsibilities was to look over the shoulder of James Marshall, who had been um, chosen in the, in the summertime. So Groves already knows that there, the, the, this long hair stuff about uh, atomic physics and these uh, kind of crazy scientists who want to build a bomb. So he already has an idea of what James Marshall has done or has not done. And so on September 17th, he says, oh no, not that thing. No, really? And Somerville says, yes, you have to go see uh, uh, Bush, Vannevar Bush at the uh, Carnegie Institution. You have to um, go see uh, uh, General Steyer, who was my assistant, and find out uh, the lowdown on what's going on in this project. So, um, uh, General Grove salutes. I, he, at this point, he's still a colonel, as a, as a matter of fact. Uh, uh, as a good Army officer, he salutes and uh, does what he's told. So he goes to see Bush, and he uh, marches into the office. Um, and. Bush has not really been told that there's a new man on the block here to uh, oversee this project. And uh, Groves, being a bit uh, gruff and uh, rough, uh, begins to quiz Bush, and Bush is uh, quite startled by the whole thing. And uh, it doesn't go well, uh, that very first meeting between uh, Groves and, and Bush. And after Groves leaves the office, because he's not getting good answers here from, uh, from, from Bush, who's holding back. And uh, so Groves <coughs> uh, returns to his office. 
and uh, begins to uh, plan about how he's going to go about this. Bush calls the Secretary of, uh, of uh, War Office and says, you know, uh, I think we're in the soup here. I mean, uh, we, this is who you have uh, chosen. And uh, his feathers are smooth and, uh, and he's now told, yes, this is the man I want. This, this is um, on high from uh, General Marshall and Secretary Stimson. This is who it's going to be. So Bush is now um, secure in knowing that this is the man I'm going to have to work with. And they become a, a, a great team and, the, and there's no problem after that. So Groves uh, immediately um, undertakes a host of decisions that are um, that, that set into motion um, the course of the Manhattan Project. Uh, on September 19th, he uh, orders uh, that Oak Ridge, Tennessee be, be, be the place where the uranium enrichment work is going to be done. He sends his assistant, uh, Colonel Nichols, who what, with the earlier James Marshall had been a part of the background here of what happened in the summer up until September. So uh, Nichols is sent to New York to um, inquire about some uh, uh, uranium ore that, uh, that might be available. That, and sure enough, uh, there was a man in New York, a Belgian, made, uh, <coughs> named uh, Edgar uh, Songier, who had already transported uh, 1,200 tons of uranium ore from um, first Africa and then uh, to, uh, to America. Um, to safeguard uh, against uh, possible uh, Nazis uh, using it in, in, in Europe. So this was a, a great windfall that uh, Groves got a running head start here. He already had some uh, high uh, value uh, uranium ore to work with. Um, he realized this is also because of his um, doing all of these uh, military projects, that the priority system is going to be an important one. And uh, you want to be at the top of, of the priority system to get what the resources that you need. So he marches into um, the office of um, war production, uh, a man named Nelson. And uh, again, Nelson, the, out of the blue, doesn't know who, who this uh, young colonel, this colonel is. And um, Gross has a letter to himself saying, I want AAA priority on anything I need. And Nelson is, doesn't know what to do here. I mean, who, who, who is this person? Um, and of course, he hasn't been told that this is, he hasn't been told what the project is. He hasn't been told that this is the person who's going to lead it. And he refuses. And Groves says, well, I guess I'm going to have to say uh, to uh, President Roosevelt that um, you're not on board in this project. Well, this startles uh, Nelson and um, causes him to uh, sign the letter. And throughout the rest of the war, uh, Groves will have uh, AAA priority on anything he needs to fulfill uh, his mission. So Groves is a kind of personality where uh, no nonsense, uh, make decisions, a great um, person who was able to size others up um, and know that they could be given responsibilities to perform their job. So these were all qualities that had been shown before in Groves's earlier career. He was West Point, he was fourth in his class, he was intelligent. He was a quick learner. He did larger and larger projects throughout the interwar period. He graduated from West Point in 1918 um, and had a series of jobs through the uh, 20s and the 30s, uh, which were uh, ever larger uh, and eventually were so large that he was in charge of all Army mobilization, as I said, uh, in the run-up to World War II. And he rose to um, the top in terms of being considered to undertake this, real, this project, which nobody knew would work or not. But our Army leadership, um, George Marshall, and uh, as I mentioned before, this uh, Brian Somerville, 
um, thought that if, if it could be done, um, this is the guy who could do it. And as it turned out, it was. I mean, if there is a secret to the building of the bomb, I think it goes to the culture of the Corps of Engineers. I mean, the, this is a, a formidable group of, of people who were a special part of the Army and the best and the brightest at West Point uh, always went into the Corps of Engineers uh, in Groves' class, uh, in previous classes, and subsequent classes. Um, if they were the most intelligent uh, and they were really a a ca I call them a cast in the book here of, of, of people who worked together, they knew each other, they followed each other's career, they always examined one another and how well they were doing. And in, a, in what became a very large army, they still remained a very tiny group. And um, throughout, they, they would know which, what, what others could do, and they kept close track of each other, and thus, Groves um, was not unique. I, I think there were other engineers, other Corps of Engineers, Army Corps of Engineers, who could have performed this task, but Groves had these special qualities that were shared by his, his brothers in the Corps of Engineers. For example, uh, Brian Somerville is, eventually he's given uh, the assignment of uh, to head what, what becomes known as Army Service Forces. He is outfitting the entire American Army, eight million people. So uh, he had this same skill that, um, that Groves had. He was a, a slightly older than Groves. But um, he, he, as a product of the Army Corps of Engineers and the education that they went through, and the things that they were given in terms of the responsibilities of building big, big things. I mean, we're talking, you know, eventually the Panama Canal and dams. And, and uh, if you look at the history of the Army Corps of Engineers, you see that they have redrawn the, uh, the, the landscape of America in terms of um, harbors and dams and rivers and, and, and big, big projects. And they had the kind of confidence that they knew they could do these things. And thus they plunged into them uh, with um, great decisiveness, uh, uh, making decisions uh, that were enormously uh, costly, and, um, and, but they had the uh, confidence that they would do it. And Groves had this in spades. I mean, he just made big decisions in a hurry, out of his instincts, out of his knowledge, out of his intelligence, chose qualified people to carry out his wishes, let them do their job, and time after time, Groves uh, can be seen as someone who um, was, was very good in choosing people. The best example is Robert Oppenheimer, um, which was Groves' decision other people didn't think Oppenheimer was going to be the man for the job, the scientific director of the Manhattan Project. Um, some people even said that, uh, you know, he he's, couldn't run a hamburger stand. He had no administrative experience. He had no managerial background. He was a theoretical physicist. Uh, brilliant, no doubt. But Grove saw something in him. Uh, which led him to believe that he was the man who was going to uh, oversee uh, the scientific direction of the building of the testing and using of the bomb. And it turned out to be the case that uh, Oppenheimer was a brilliant choice, um, organized the team in uh, Los Alamos, but Groves did it again and again and again and again uh, with uh, uh, populating all of these different sites, people at Oak Ridge, people at uh, Hanford, uh, the major sites, uh, and he chose uh, again and again uh, people to carry out his mission uh, and uh, let them do their jobs. He had very tight uh, lines uh, to them uh, through the phone and through visits, uh, face to face, finding out what they did, but not micromanaging things and letting them do what they had to do to, um, to succeed. 
which, which they did. So this was a quality that Groves had, um, and, uh, but it was shared by, by others who um, had the same kind of skill. I mean, it's, it's certainly the case with uh, General George Marshall. Uh, it's certainly the case with uh, Secretary Stimson. Uh, all of these people had uh, this, this similar quality of uh, being able to size someone up and know that they would do the job and let them do it which I find is a remarkable uh, trait uh, uh, of the times and uh, you know, part of the success of uh, winning, I think, World War II and uh, in this case, uh, developing uh, a, an atomic weapon. Uh, I, I think part of the, uh, again, part of the secret of, um, of uh, building the bomb in such a short period of time uh, was this uh, uh, quality that uh, many had that um, uh, well, first of all, it was a very serious time here. I mean, perhaps the Germans were building an atomic bomb, uh, and we had to build one first. So there, w and we had to overall win the war against uh, first the Germans and uh, and then the Japanese. So um, the the overall seriousness of the situation was uh, was extreme, and um, these people that um, occupied these high positions uh, did not lack in ambition, and certainly Groves was, uh, was one of those. So after he um, dusted himself off on September 17th and realized that he was not going to go to Europe and be a combat engineer, uh, I think he decided, well, this is, this is how I'm going to make my mark in this war. Uh, I'm going to do, I'm going to commit every ounce of, uh, of uh, talent and resources that I have to it. And uh, from really the minute he got the job, he, 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 he was off to the races and, and never let up and put his foot on the accelerator uh, full speed ahead. So he had driving ambition. And he saw that he could only achieve uh, his goals um, by combining his ambition with other people's ambition. And I think the thing he saw that in uh, Oppenheimer was uh, not only a, a very intelligent, brilliant man, but someone who uh, had perhaps been slighted by his uh, brothers. He hadn't had a Nobel Prize, and Groves had uh, the pick of the lot here for if he wanted to choose someone who had already been given high accolades. So I think he saw in uh, Oppenheimer uh, an ambition, a what I called a, a route to immortality, uh, that they both um, could join together and do each other's work for them. So Oppenheimer knew that Groves could supply him with anything he needed. Any amount of um, uh, mechanical workings or any scientist that he, he wanted. All Groves had to do was to um, pick up the phone, uh, make sure that that scientist was part of the scientific team in Los Alamos or anywhere else. And um, Grove saw in, Opp in, in Oppenheimer um, a skill uh, to mobilize, uh, to uh, crack these difficult questions. Again, none, none of this had been done before. Yes, it all was uh, theoretically possible and it had been shown by these uh, smart scientists that, uh, you know, it should be the case. But then it became a process of uh, how to engineer it, how to make it practical, how to uh, turn this uh, theory into uh, a working bomb. And um, so, you know, General Groves, I mean, he, uh, he didn't waste a minute. Uh, really, from uh, September 17th on, he was um, uh, full speed ahead, uh, pedal on the accelerator and, and never let up. So every day was a series of um, pro probably several dozen phone calls to uh, all of the uh, people who were working for him. And his offices were over in the uh, what was then called the New War Building, which is today the old part of the State Department uh, building, uh, on the fifth floor in a small suite of offices with just a, a handful of uh, people at the very pinnacle of this uh, giant uh, pyramid 
which came to be, you know, hundreds of thousands of people eventually worked on the Manhattan Project. Not all of them full time. Uh, they built things and left, but um, hundreds of thousands of people uh, were uh, part of the Manhattan Project. And for Groves, uh, every day was a, a series of um, phone calls, uh, making decisions, uh, making dozens of decisions uh, every single day. I'm sorry. No, nobody ever calls me. I can't imagine. No, no, really, honestly. Um, so General Groves uh, every day faced uh, uh, decisions that had to be made, um, small ones, uh, medium ones, and some very, very large ones uh, uh, eventually. Um, so he conducted all of this out of, the, uh, out of his uh, small suite of offices on the fifth floor of the, uh, what was then the New War Building, today the old part of the State Department building. At the time it was uh, just completed really, and uh, the Army Corps of Engineers had moved into it. Uh, on the sixth floor, and so as not to arouse uh, too much uh, attention, uh, Groves decided to stay in the same building and just occupy uh, some offices on the fifth floor, which he did. So that's where the Manhattan Project was run from, that's where Ground Zero was uh, with regard to um, the Manhattan Project. There was another set of offices in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, uh, which uh, eventually uh, Nichols, Ken Nichols, Kenneth Nichols, um, was the district engineer and uh, oversaw um, things having to do with uh, what took place in Oak Ridge and Hanford and, and, and so on. But Groves was, uh, he, he didn't waste a minute uh, during the day. Um, he traveled a great deal and he would go to these different places. He would go to Oak Ridge, he would go to Hanford, uh, he would go to Los Alamos. Um, he would visit the uh, corporation offices of uh, the different places, the different uh, corporations that he recruited. Uh, he would often go to New York um, uh, for the day, or Wilmington, Delaware, which is where DuPont was. Um, and he wouldn't waste any time uh, aboard the train. Uh, again, we, we see um, what sort of uh, person he was in terms of his managerial skills. Uh, oftentimes, uh, assistants would get on the train with him if he's going to, say, Chicago or even to uh, all the way out to uh, New Mexico. Uh, and um, he would dictate letters and uh, tell them things to do. They'd get off the train uh, with their um, letters that had to be drafted and go back to Washington and send them off. Uh, that was a way that he um, made every minute count. Um, or sometimes people would come and uh, get on the train, let's say he's in New Mexico, they'd get on the train in Chicago and ride back with him to Washington, inform him of everything that had happened. Uh, these were the letters that came in, these were the telephone calls. And so the time that it took from t to go by train from Chicago to back to Washington was not wasted in the time he got to the office and was ready and informed. and. Um, and uh, used the time uh, to, to, to great um, uh, uh, purpose. Um, at a certain point, the Secretary of War thought that um, he even needed his own airplane and uh, to, to cut down on the uh, amount of time. And uh, thus, uh, he did get a plane eventually to, to get to these places. Uh, the Secretary of War was also concerned that perhaps uh, Groves might die of a heart attack or uh, be in an accident and, and be killed, and uh, then what would we do? Um, so they decided on a number two, uh, which became uh, another general, uh, someone named Tom Farrell, Thomas Farrell, who became Groves' number two, um, and was told everything and had a role in the last months of the war. Uh, and building of the bomb. So uh, General Farrell is an interesting man, another Ar Army Corps of Engineer. Um, Groves liked this engineer brotherhood that he knew firsthand and uh, gave many of them uh, responsibilities. 
and uh, had close relationships with the uh, corporate people who uh, had these same kinds of skills, people who could make a decision on the spot and uh, move, move forward. Um, I titled my biography of General Groves, uh, Racing for the Bomb, and um, I think this element of speed um, was felt uh, certainly very, very intensely by General Groves, that not a minute could be wasted. Uh, it might have a role in deciding the war and ending the war, which I think it did, and thus uh, speed was uh, uh, the utmost in uh, almost everything he did. Um, and um, there was no relaxation, he never took a vacation, uh, he worked uh, you know, 16, 18 hour days, he expected the same from everybody else, and thus uh, the whole uh, energy of the, of the project was built around not wasting a minute in uh, developing and testing and using the bomb. Of course, part of the uh, element of speed here was to um, take a, a rather unorthodox uh, way of building these plants and, and, and conducting the overall operation. I mean, normally it would be sequential. You'd build maybe a, power, a, a pilot plant, you'd then uh, design something, uh, you'd develop it. And what Groves decided was there was no time for any of this. Everything had to happen at the same time. There was no way to build a pilot plant and then piggyback on it to, to build the, the, the larger thing. You had to go ahead and design things, begin to build it, and compress everything into one process by which you would end up with the finished plant. So there was n no time for any of this. Otherwise, the, the plutonium or the highly enriched uranium, which I think were the pacing items for everything. I mean, when there was enough highly enriched uranium for a bomb, it was ready to be used, and it was. By an amazing coincidence, at approximately the exact same time, down to the day, there was enough plutonium for a test and an, an, another amount for using for the bombs. So both bombs were ready at approximately the same time. Now, it didn't have to be that way. I mean, that is, to me, an amazing coincidence that out of these two very, very complex processes, how to enrich uranium through various methods, either electromagnetic separation or gaseous diffusion or thermal diffusion, and all three ways were used, you had enough highly enriched uranium at the end of July, at the um, end of July, 1945, and this wholly different process where you built reactors and through chemical separation got enough plutonium, at approximately the same time at the end of July you had enough for it for a test in the middle of July and enough for a, a bomb at, in, the, er, in early August. To me this is, this is quite striking that um, things worked out this way. It didn't have to be. It could have been another way if other decisions had been made. In fact, people have calculated that if they had gone ahead with the normal way um, of, of building things, that there wouldn't have been plutonium for several more years. Um, and thus, all of post-war history, all of World War II history, and what came afterwards would have been entirely different if, if the plutonium had not been ready when it was. Now, we could add even further here that um, Groves' concern with, with, with speed in finishing this thing uh, entered into uh, the way Hanford operated. There was what was called the speed-up program. And here, um, the reactors were now built and, and turned on at the end of 44 and the beginning of 45. And Groves had a supply of plutonium that was going to occur, but he wanted it quicker. He wanted it faster. So what do you do? Well, you turn up the dial and you make those reactors go above 250 megawatts. Or you push out the rods that are in the reactor sooner. You don't let them 
cook and be critical as long as, as possible. That's another way to speed up things. Or you take, and the third thing is to take them out of the cooling pool earlier and get them into the chemical separation plant to get the uh, plutonium quicker. So at a certain point, Grove says, we have to do all three of those things. And as we go through February, March, April, and May, he's pushing DuPont, turn up the dial, push out the rods faster, don't let it cool as fast in the, in the uh, pools. I want the plutonium more quickly than what you would originally uh, have done. Now it's been calculated that if they had just let the uh, reactors go and just gone through the normal process of not turning up the reactor, not pushing out the rods as quickly as they did, and letting it cool the required amount, that the plutonium would not have been ready until October or November for, for the first bomb and for the test. So the reason that there is enough plutonium, as I said, about six kilograms, about 13 pounds for the Trinity test device and for the Nagasaki bomb, the reason that there is enough uh, ready when there is, early July and early August, uh, is because of this speed-up program, which had there not been General Groves, uh, perhaps would not have transpired. I mean, it was his decision to um, uh, tell DuPont to make it more quickly, and this is how it can be done, and this is what was done. So again, the element of um, the personality of the uh, commanding general of the entire thing, I think, um, was instrumental in, in producing the plutonium when it was ready. And when it was ready, it, it was tested, and the test was a success, and uh, another amount was used in that first uh, Nagasaki bomb. By that point, of course, there was um, a supply of plutonium that was coming from Hanford to uh, Los Alamos, and m many third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh bombs were, were in line and, and, and would have been there had they been needed. But of course, uh, the, the two bombs were um, uh, enough, but more were in the pipeline. And uh, by that point, Groves was able to predict and tell uh, Marshall and Stimson uh, this is how many bombs that um, I can have on given dates uh, if Japan did not surrender, which of course they did, but um, more bombs were, were ready uh, in the aftermath of August uh, and, and on into September and October. So um, uh, I, again, I think the, this demonstrates the uh, uh, intensity of uh, the personality of General Groves in terms of uh, speed and uh, how every minute uh, counted and um, basically every minute did. At, at a certain point in 1944, um, the scientists discovered that the original design for their plutonium bomb uh, was not going to work. Now we know that the highly enriched uranium bomb, what became known as Little Boy, was based on a design of two subcritical pieces of highly enriched uranium being slammed together and exploding because it became a critical mass. That original design, a, using plutonium, two pieces of plutonium that were going to get pushed together, they originally thought they could do that. But throughout the um, uh, examination of the properties of plutonium and the plutonium, the tiny smidgens that they had, they realized it was going to fizzle. It wouldn't work. And thus, Groves and all the rest of them, and DuPont, were faced with the prospect that maybe building Hanford, and Hanford cost about, at the time, $350 million, which would be about $5 billion today. So it's a pretty big project. Perhaps it was in vain. Perhaps this plutonium wouldn't be able to be used in a bomb. But like so many things with the Manhattan Project, just at the time that something 
was needed to be sold, it was. And what was sold here was a different design to the plutonium bomb. Instead of slamming two pieces of plutonium together, we would take a, um, a ball of it and compress it inward. Uh, we would implode it and make it critical that way. And thus this alternative design uh, became the, uh, the new thing that had to be uh, um, figured out and developed and became the, the plutonium bomb design. Um, so there was a crash program at um, Los Alamos to, to do all of this. Uh, and they stopped using the old design, which they would, would not work. Um, and there was new hope that this plutonium uh, design, uh, known, which has become known as implosion, would be the new way to do things. So how are you going to compress this ball of plutonium, which is no bigger than your fist or an orange, and, and weighed about uh, six kilograms, how would you compress it uh, simultaneously with high explosives that are going to direct all of the explosive energy inward into a critical mass? So that became the new, um, the, the new problem that they had to solve, and, and of course they did. And that's why it had to be tested uh, in the desert of New Mexico in uh, July 16th to see if uh, it would work. They were so confident of the other design of highly enriched uranium where two pieces of subcritical highly enriched uranium are slammed together that they didn't need to test it. And they were sure that was going to work. And thus it did at uh, Hiroshima and the uh, little boy bomb. But they needed a test for the uh, implosion design. And um, thus, uh, what, what must have been a, an incredible shock uh, when Groves first learned that the plutonium design, the original plutonium design, wouldn't work. And maybe all of his efforts at Hanford were uh, a waste of money, which uh, would not be good for a future career. So, um, you know, there's part of the ambition of all of these people, of course, was to make a success of this and not to have a, a big white elephant at the end here that um, had wasted uh, hundreds of millions of dollars of um, uh, taxpayers' money. So that was always looming over their shoulder. And um, Groves thought, you know, if this thing failed, uh, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll put me in a military prison here. I'll never see the light of day again. So. Um, to say nothing of, of um, the decision to use the bomb to begin with. Um, and you know, this is a very controversial uh, topic that uh, continues to uh, occupy historians to this day um, about whether or not the decision to use the bomb was, uh, was the right one. But what would be, again, what would have been uh, the situation for uh, President Truman? Uh, had he had a weapon, uh, available that he didn't use, that he decided not to use uh, in the summer of uh, 1945 uh, to possibly end the war. And uh, uh, American uh, soldiers and uh, military were being killed uh, every day. And, the go and what if the war had gone on um, many, many more months and um, afterwards it had been um, seen that this weapon was available but not used. Uh, so that it loomed over Harry Truman's uh, shoulder as well uh, in terms of, uh, the, I think, the decision to use the bomb. Now, of course, Truman only became president uh, in the middle of April after uh, Roosevelt died, uh, April 1945, April 12th exactly. So um, already the war in Europe was uh, about to end in another few weeks, in the beginning of May, May 7th. And uh, it, it became the Pacific uh, theater that uh, this bomb was going to be used because it wasn't ready yet in uh, May of 1945. It hadn't been tested. It hadn't even been put together. So uh, the, the war was over in May. Uh, the test was uh, done in uh, July. Um, 
and it was Japan that was going to be uh, the target for this. And um, Truman thus was uh, thrust into a, a situation where um, the momentum of going forward with um, using this bomb, I think, was so overwhelming that he really didn't have a decision uh, over it. If we use the word decision in some sort of calculated way where things are weighed back and forth, he was, uh, he would have to go against uh, this momentum, which was just about impossible to do. Uh, he had at his, um, in his cabinet, uh, people like uh, Henry Stimson. Uh, he had as the chief of staff, uh, General Marshall. Uh, he would have had to have come up with a very, very strong reason not to use the bomb. I mean, I think that's the only decision that he could have made. And so he went with the momentum. He went with what was already moving at a very, very fast pace. And I think the engineer of this locomotive was General Groves. I mean, he is pushing this thing as fast as he can. Um, things are going on uh, around uh, the building of the bomb. Of course, there's this Potsdam conference in uh, Germany in uh, mid-July when uh, Stimson learns of the success of the test in the Me New Mexico des desert. And uh, you know, during that conference informs his ally, Stalin, that uh, there's a new weapon to be used uh, in Japan. And uh, Stalin probably already knew about it, uh, given the espionage and uh, the, the crack in the security framework. So Stalin probably already knew uh, about uh, the successful test and knew that the United States was uh, developing uh, a kind of super weapon um, in, in the middle of July when he was uh, told by Truman that there was this new weapon that was going to be used against Japan. And uh, all Stalin uh, sort of nonchalantly said, well, I, I hope you use it wisely. And uh, that was it. So no doubt Stalin knew already about uh, the, the test that had taken place in uh, the New Mexico desert as he had uh, a couple of spies in Los Alamos who were transmitting information uh, back to Moscow. Uh, the most well-known, of course, was uh, Klaus Fuchs. Uh, later, we learned that there was another spy named uh, Theodore Hall, uh, a Harvard, young Harvard student who was uh, an American who was uh, sent to Los Alamos and was this second spy that corroborated uh, Fuchs's information uh, getting back to Moscow. I, I think there are others uh, that haven't been found yet, so there's still uh, more to know about uh, Soviet espionage during the atomic bomb program. But uh, nevertheless, uh, Stalin, uh, when he was informed of, um, uh, of this new weapon by Truman um, and had this information um, from his uh, sources, um, still didn't do anything until Hiroshima. And at that point, he orders his own people uh, on a crash program for a development of, of a, a Soviet bomb, which will take approximately the same length of time. It takes about four years, and uh, in uh, August 1949, uh, the Soviets detonate their first uh, atomic bomb and um, transform you know, geopolitics in terms of uh, U.S.-Soviet relations and the Cold War is, is really now intense and an uh, arms race is underway with building um, what will eventually be uh, tens of thousands of nuclear weapons on both sides. But it all really begins at, um, uh, during the Manhattan Project and uh, the uh, Soviet program is uh, really on hold. Um, not very much is being done. Uh, of course, the Soviets have many, many other things that need to be done to defeat Germany, and um, they can't devote much energy to building the bomb until um, the war is ended, and uh, uh, that they do in uh, the end of 1945 and 46, and eventually are successful in uh, building um, 
what comes to be a, a fairly um, mirror image of uh, what was done during the Manhattan Project. Uh, they mobilized in some of the same fashion. They built uh, plutonium reactors. They uh, also built uh, uranium enrichment facilities. And uh, um, of course, knowing that it could be done is um, probably the biggest secret of all. And um, uh, how to do it, uh, uh, they figure out on themselves. But the espionage is said to have saved them probably, oh, maybe 18 months, maybe, uh, uh, maybe two years of, of effort that they didn't have to go down uh, dead ends and, and, and redo things. So they learned a great deal from the Manhattan Project and uh, it helped them make their own bomb, which um, took them approximately the same per period of time as the Americans.